Mike Pilkington, who will be- Hey, Carlos. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Mike's going to be talking good. to us about uh, Mac response, the good, the bad, bad and the ugly. Um, and just to introduce Mike, he is at Control Risks. He is an author and instructor at the Sands Institute for the courses FOR 508, Advanced Digital Forensics, an incident response and FOR 608 enterprise class, incident response and threat hunting. After spending much of his career working in large corporate environments in the oil and gas industry, specifically Halliburton and Shell, Mike joined SANS in 2017 as a full-time researcher in the SANS Research Operations Center. His current role focuses on R&D projects in support of the digital forensics and incident response program. Take it away, Mike. All right, thank you. And let me make sure I can share my screen. Okay, here we go. All right, let me know if you see my uh, my main slide there, okay? That's great. Excellent. All right, cool. Thanks, Carlos. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, super excited to be here to talk about a topic that's been kind of um, a, a, a big part of what I've been working on for the past year or so, which is, um, Mac forensic analysis. I've also been digging into Linux and Docker analysis, really looking at a few different things. Uh, I'll, I'll just do a quick correction there on, on my intro. I'm actually at SANS Institute. And to give you a little bit of my background, I've been um, working in IT, various roles within IT for 25 or so years. I started out with an oil and gas company called Halliburton and then moved to Shell, but I've done different things from systems administration, network administration, uh, network you know, security, and uh, for the past dozen or so years, really been focused on forensics and incident response. And it's just a, a fascinating area. So really, um, you know, always excited to find new topics to dig into. And there's no shortage of those. And so, like I said, uh, Mac operating system is actually a pretty new one for me. Um, I actually had a Mac since like 2013, so almost 10 years. But I was the most basic Mac user for the longest time. I really just uh, I had the fortune of getting a Mac uh, Air, and it was one of my little travel laptops as I was, you know, working and, and doing uh, various uh, work for SANS and, and my day job. And it was just kind of a nice backup laptop, to be honest with you. But um, I've kind of uh, started digging in more because the class uh, that we've just started teaching at, at SANS this year, Forensic 608, is really delving into enterprise forensics, looking at more than just kind of your, your Windows systems. That's uh, primarily what we look at in Forensics 508. But Forensics 608, we're looking at, uh, you know, multiple different platforms and also looking at larger scale intrusions. So I don't want to spend too much on uh, time on that. I just want to give you a heads up that, you know, it really gave me an opportunity to kind of dig into this platform. And it's been fun to kind of learn something new. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm still not the hugest fan of some of the UI. Uh, there's some things that really annoy me, like you just can't get to certain parts of the file system with Finder, the file browser, which still just bugs me, and a few other, you know, things like that. But I have to admit the, um, you know, the technology is very cool. The operating system is really beautiful to use. The, uh, the hardware is incredible as well. So, um, so yeah, that's where I'm coming from it. But uh, so I'm not going to say I'm the biggest expert in Mac forensics. Uh, I'm, I put myself at a pretty high level on Windows. I'm getting better on Mac and I'm having kind of fun digging in. So the way I wanted to do this was kind of structure this from almost a newbie's perspective in a certain sense, like how, how is the Mac operating system set up? How can we do some analysis uh, on these systems? It is not the most straightforward platform. And that is certainly by design. Uh, you know, Mapple has really locked them down fairly significantly. Uh, that does not mean they're impenetrable. And uh, maybe we'll talk about you know a few examples of that as we go, but uh, but they do make things difficult for 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 malware and for attackers, in some cases even for the users, uh, but uh, and and certainly for security in some senses. So we talk about you know doing its response with our forensic tooling. We need to look at some ways to um, to get over those hurdles. So about the first half of the talk is going to be kind of designed around looking at those hurdles and how we can get around them, specifically with Velociraptor. And then uh, the second half will be talking about kind of things that we can do to do the analysis once we've gotten uh, the visibility that we need. Okay, so um, yeah, just a quick overview of the agenda here, looking at uh, some of those security uh, security challenges. So it comes to you know dead box analysis. Uh, what's going to happen if you do want to pull the system 
offline and image the host. Uh, what are the capabilities to do that? So we'll talk about that. There's a couple of different encryption levels we have to be thinking about. Then more pertinent to, to you know, Velociraptor analysis is live analysis. And what are some of the you know, things that Apple has done to kind of lock down the operating system that really makes it hard for our tooling as well. So we'll talk about system integrity protection and transparency, consent and control. And then I want to walk you through deployment scenario. So ideally, you're going to use that last step there, which is enterprise uh, mobile device management. And I'll have just a quick slide on some you know, points there. But um, you know, if you're taking this in baby steps, you want to do an initial deployment or just kind of start testing, I'll show you a few of the things that you need to do manually to set up a Velociraptor on a host and a couple of the hurdles you want to get over there. So that's the first part. And then the second part is, yeah, looking at a few artifacts that are particularly useful. And by artifacts, I do mean uh, Velociraptor artifacts. Some, a couple of uh, things that, you know, are, are kind of newish in Velociraptor. And so that's pretty exciting. And, um, and maybe one or two areas where we can still um, look for, you know, making some additional visibility, some artifacts. And, you know, I, I really wished I'd had more time. I wanted to spend more time, but I did start collaborating uh, a little bit with Mike and also with uh, Matt and, and Wes. And so we have, you know, thrown around a few ideas of some additional things to do. And there's certainly no shortage of uh, additional artifacts and collections we can do with this tool. Okay, so let's talk about kind of the first level of difficulty when it comes to doing uh, Mac analysis and actually getting access to the data. That is a significant um, a challenge in some cases. The first level of um, you know, difficulty here is the encryption. And so there's two versions of encryption and often both that are employed. So there's hardware level encryption that is on modern Mac operating systems, Mac systems. And the first one being uh, the T2 based uh, hardware chip that is really soldered onto the motherboard. It's now built into the M1 and M2. So this is really something that you know, you've got to be kind of um, you know, aware of. Now, um, that uh, T2 chip you can think of a little bit like a TPM, although it actually has even more capabilities. It's, it's built in and uh, functions to help secure things like um, the touch ID and fingerprint sensor and some other features. Um, but largely it's keeping keys, you know, from our perspective, keeping keys for um, hardware encrypting the SSD or the drive, you know, really whatever technology a drive is on the system. Uh, now that's one level. And so really what that means is that removing the hard drive and trying to image the drive separate from that device is probably not possible. I'm not aware of any way to do it separate from that device. And uh, so now, as I mentioned, you know, removing the drive, so I'm gonna do a little highlighting here, but uh, removing the drives from uh, Mac systems is a challenge in itself. So a lot of times we're not even worried about that and you can do it directly against the device, but uh, that is uh, certainly an extra challenge here is that you need that hardware encryption that's built on the board with the T2 chip to uh, decrypt it. So that's the first level of encryption. And then typically what's also enabled is going to be essentially a volume based encryption. And that's going to be, uh, based off of the user's passwords. There is a file vault that takes care of the, the user's drive as well as the uh, startup volume. And so it's essentially gonna, you know, hard, or essentially going to encrypt everything really of interest to us. And so we need the key to be able to get to that. Now the key can be in the form of the password of the user or it can be in recovery keys. So there's two different types of recovery keys. There's what's called the, um, there's actually what's called the institutional key, which really gives you the ability to use across multiple systems if you're deploying that kind of with an MDM solution. And it's essentially one key can unlock all the hosts. You can imagine that that is a pretty darn sensitive key. So it might not be the best idea to necessarily do that, but, uh, but that is an option. And the other one's called more of a personal key or individual key, and that is on a system by system basis. Now, um, MDM solutions, uh, modern uh, uh, mobile device management solutions, generally all have the capability to escrow these keys and keep them uh, for an enterprise. And so that's highly recommended that you do that. And, uh, and that can simplify you, you know, your ability to, creep, to decrypt that drive 
if you need a full, a full disk image you know, from a dead system. Now, as I mentioned at the bottom, generally we're really focused more on you know, live response anyway. So both of these encryption technologies may not come into play that much, but in certain circumstances they might. And we'll talk about another technology in a minute called SIPS, uh, System Integrity Protection, which makes things a little harder to do the live analysis. So that's one case where maybe it does make sense to fall back to full disk imaging, even though it's slower for instant response, but it still gives you access to all of the data. All right, um, so that's kind of data at risk, encrypting that disk um, both at the hardware level and uh, kind of a user level in a sense with uh, almost user-based uh, encryption, but uh, really covering that whole volume. Next is system integrity protection. Now, this is uh, data in motion. This is protecting the operating system as it is uh, you know, performing its duties, it's up and running. And so this gets into the area where Apple has really tried to lock down this host and make it more difficult uh, for malware, for malicious activity to occur. And it's certainly worked. It's, uh, it does make things more difficult. It's, this is system integrity protection in particular is implemented through a technology called mandatory access control, which really gives you the ability to do you know, um, permissioning beyond just your standard user group, other read, write, execute. Uh, there's other labels, other levels of security that can ap be applied, and it really kind of can lock down uh, files and lock down processes from doing certain things, even if those processes are running its root. So this provides uh, you know, a lot of protection, even if the attacker has gotten root access. Now, for us, uh, you know, as analysts who may have root access, it also prevents us from doing some certain things that we would like to do potentially. Um, now it does lock down, you know, a number of files to be able to, um, to modify and it, it basically there's a certain locations within the file system that it really locks down. For example, the slash system, uh, directory at the root of the operating system, root of the file system is pretty locked down, uh, parts of slash user, parts of slash bin and S bin. Um, but for the most part, they're locked down from editing, not necessarily from viewing and reading. And that's good for us because actually it means that like with Velociraptor, for example, I've only found a few cases, almost edge cases where I couldn't do um, a particular analysis, couldn't read a particular file uh, when it had what we'll call full desk access in a moment, um, but even with system integrity protection enabled. Now, all that said is there might be times where you do want to disable it and it can be disabled. You have to go and reboot the system into recovery mode and in that case, you can disable system integrity protection and, and get access to all of those files, including the ability here to uh, do a live uh, full disk image, you know, with tools like, uh, you know, FTK Imager or FResponse or some other tool that would give you, um, you know, that full access, which you cannot do. Uh, you can't access that full dry, uh, disk drive device if SIP is enabled, okay? So keep that in mind, but um, nevertheless, you know, that is some restrictions and you will run into it probably with doing a lot of analysis. Uh, however, I've seen most of the time, it's not really going to slow us up uh, from doing that analysis. That said, uh, you may want to disable it for one reason or another for live analysis, for the full disk analysis. So you can potentially do that temporarily, or maybe this is a scenario where you want to actually just take the system down and do a disk acquisition offline to be able to look at it. Because SIP is only you know, impacting the live audit running system. Once it's you know, a dead disk, we can see everything. Something to keep in mind too, where this may you know, be more likely that you would want to be able to get to that level, um, you know, these are kernel level protections. And being that they're kernel level protections, you know, they're going to, prevent our typical tooling from accessing certain files. But the problem is, is that there have been more exploits against uh, Apple recently than I can remember, especially from a kernel level. There was a pretty big one, a zero day announced just three days ago. And there was not a big one released last, uh, last month that had some active uh, exploits in the wild against it. So you can imagine if the attacker has the ability to run as kernel, it's gonna be able to access any of these locations at once 
It can even actually set up policies that could prevent us from seeing the malicious uh, data uh, that's kind of secured by secu uh, system integrity protection. Okay, so something to be in mind to to bear in mind that um, you know even though our standard visibility is pretty good, even with SIP enabled, uh, there might be times where we really need to go that deeper level and see make sure we're seeing everything. Okay, here's the next one, and this is definitely one that's uh, going to impact you pretty quickly without, uh, you know, taking it into account and, and making sure that Velociraptor, for, for our intents and purposes, has the ability to see uh, pretty much all of the files except for the few that are even locked down by SIP, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, transparency, consent, and control is another feature of Apple that they've implemented for several years and kind of continued to implement it more and more significantly over the years to really lock down applications, ability to use uh, and access private data. So in our for our purposes, you know, that really boils down basically to, you know, the files, which files can we access and, and are we being, you know, prevented from seeing those files? But it also, of course, affects, you know, devices, for you know, Zoom or other apps, if you're using Macs, you're really familiar with you know having to give access to the camera or to the mic to, or to applications like Zoom to be able to use them. But um, for applications that are accessing data on the disk, you have to give that same access. So you know whether it's um, you know Office apps or even the terminal itself, like seeding into the user's documents directory. You get a little pop-up saying, do you want the terminal to access your documents? And you have to say yes, if you want that. Um, so that is going to you know, secure all applications, right? Security applications included, and certainly Velociraptor as well. Now, what this means is that without taking some steps, we would be able to see important locations like users, you know, documents, downloads, desktop, uh, iDrive cloud removal volumes, network volumes. All of these places are secured by this feature called transparency, consent, and control, where the user is prompted to provide approval to access these sensitive locations. So we'll walk through in a moment how to set this up. Unfortunately, this can be implemented and kind of um, provided access to our security tooling through policy, through MDM solutions. And it can also be done manually. So I'll walk you through the manual steps as well. Uh, but it does need to be done because by default, there's no access to those areas. And I mean, if no other area, you can imagine something like uh, downloads being a pretty important part. If we're doing an IR case, maybe the attackers accidentally dilute, downloaded a malicious you know, executable or script or something, and we need to kind of validate that, verify where it went. So I want to bring up a note here, and then actually one other note. I'm gonna let me go to the other note for a moment too. So in this link, um, well, that's the the reference at the bottom is a, it's a link to a different location, but um, I want to bring up one document, and because I've read, I've seen this a couple of different places, even in Apple. So this is straight from Apple, um, indicating you know what locations are secured by transparency, consent, and control. Okay, so they mentioned here. You know, documents, downloads, iCloud, I drive, uh, network volumes, and somewhere else I've seen remote, uh, you know, removable drives as well. And um, here they're talking about, you know, basically how the user can give access to those locations. In some cases, the user is going to be prompted by the application. So if it's individual files and folders within, say, the desktop or downloads, the user is going to get a nice little prompt to say, hey, can you? Um, do you want to allow terminal or do you want to allow Word to access those locations? The user can say yes or no. Um, but in some cases, for more you know, full featured access, in other words, if you just want to wholesale say, give all access to these locations to a file, there's no prompt to, it, to request that of the user. That has to be manually set. Um, either through policy or by the user specifically going into the security and privacy um, applet uh, and specifying that they wanna allow that application to have what's what they call full disk access. 
which is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not full disk. There's some things they can't do, of course, based off their own permissions and then SIP as well. But by full disk access in this contest, uh, context, it means all of these things, desktop, uh, downloads, you know, documents, et cetera. There's the one other reason though I brought this up and I've, like I said, I've seen this a couple of different places, but I've recently done some testing. I'm just not seeing this, but it is an interesting point. And it says that uh, items in the user's trash are protected from any apps that are given that full disk access. Uh, the user won't be prompted for app access. And if the user wants apps act to access the files, they must be removed from the trash to another location. And that's kind of interesting too from IR, right? Because maybe the user did download something malicious. They didn't realize it at first. And then they got a little scared, like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm just going to delete it. They put it in their trash folder. And now we can't necessarily see that or can't directly recover it. Uh, but despite seeing this here, and actually, like I said, well, at least one other place I noticed this, uh, with Velociraptor, I've done a couple of tests and have no problem actually extracting the file out of the user's trash directory, as long as we've taken the step to um, give full kind of disk access, they call it full storage access here, but it's really full disk access if you see it in the UI. As long as I've given that, I can get to the user's trash directory uh, without a problem. Okay, there's one other point here. Now this one's, uh, this this reference below, I won't take the time to go through it, but definitely check that out. And by the way, I forgot to put it up there, but um, I do have uh, this presentation available for download if you go to dfir.2 slash VLOCON 2022. You can download this presentation and I'll have a link to it at the end as well. Um, but this one's a really good one from Phil Stokes at Sentinel-1. And one of the things he points out is a little bit of a caveat that a lot of administrators and you know uh, users may not realize is that um, even if you don't give an application this kind of access to certain locations or even a full disk access, Turns out applications, including malicious apps, can still write to those locations and they can read what they've written. They just can't read other files without being granted that access. Okay, so why is that important? Well, possibly if our tooling doesn't have that visibility in those locations, you know, the attacker could be kind of writing to those spots and basically, basically being able to read and write their own data, but we don't see it, right? Because we don't have that visibility. So multiple reasons that our tooling should have this quote unquote full disk access. Okay, so uh, full disk access, quite, quite easy to deploy uh, with MDM. Uh, again, it's, it is kind of a misnomer because they don't really give you full disk access, but it gives you access to all of these kind of privacy locations. What if you need to do uh, manual installation? Well, let's, um, let's pop through that here uh, with a few pointers because um, you know, in some cases you might need to do it manually, and there are definitely a few gotchas, a few pitfall falls that you could fall into uh, if you're doing it manually. All right, so what would be the process? Well, first you want to install uh, Velociraptor's root. So just like always, kind of build this config, and we do the install installation here, service installation or service install. And what that's going to end up doing is copying over the binary to uh, user local sbin. And it's going to put the persistence method of a launch daemon and library launch daemons. And so it'll start automatically going forward. It's also monitored that if it crashes, it will restart. Now that's getting us uh, Velociraptor up and running at that point, but we still don't have full disk access. And so if you're doing this manually, here's an important caveat to doing it. You're going to have to coach the user into um, providing full disk access to the Velociraptor binary. Uh, if, if you use the default location, then it'll be in user local bin. Apple does not provide a CLI option to do this because that would defeat the purpose. It would allow for automation. It would allow for users to not have that transparency and that visibility that this application is accessing these sensitive locations. Um, so you can understand why Apple did that, but it is, from our perspective, definitely a pain. <laughs> um, so we will show you, uh, I'll show you a moment, uh, a slide that's got some resources on how to do this through MDM solutions, but if it's manually, you're gonna have to have a user set this up. 
Third step could potentially be disable SIP. And like I mentioned, there might be some cases where you'd want to take that in consideration and do it. Okay. All right, so let's talk about a couple of hiccups first. If you're doing this manually and downloading through standard method of you know, going on the browser, going to GitHub, uh, apples like Mac have this concept of mark of the web that indicates that a file was downloaded from the internet and it tags it with uh, and, and puts it into essentially a quarantine or it's not into a quarantine, but it's given a uh, what's called an extended attribute that says, you know, this was um, in the quarantine, it came from the internet. Now, a couple of different things we could do. If you, you, one is you could just avoid downloading it from the internet directly with a browser. You could do something like curl or git instead. Or you know you could put it into a central file server and make sure that the um, the quarantine extended attributes removed and share it that way. If it does land on your system though, and you're getting this method, this message that you know think can't check your software, and there's really nothing you can do but say okay, like I guess I can't run it. <laughs> Well, in that case, actually, what you can do is you can um, go into security and privacy to send system preferences uh, on the general tab here and then just say allow anyway. That's the, uh, you know, that's one method. Another option is at the command line, you can strip that uh, quarantine extended attribute by running xadder dash d com.apple.quarantine and path to your Velociraptor binary. After you do that, you still may be prompted of uh, the fact that Velociraptor can't be checked for malicious software. Uh, do you still want to open it? And of course, you would say yes in this case. Now, part of the reason we're getting this is because Velociraptor is not currently, doesn't currently have a, an Apple signature, like a notary a assigned Apple um, signature. But of course, uh, all the code from Velociraptor is signed. It's, uh, you know, get those signatures when you download it from uh, from GitHub, it's just not using the Apple signature process. I was chatting with Mike, Mike uh, yesterday or the day before, and he said he's been actually talking a little bit with Rapid7 about how they do it. So maybe we'll be able to um, to get it, you know, officially signed through the Apple developer process. But uh, in any case, you can still validate the code yourself, but you just get this message uh, from Apple that it's not signed with their uh, signature process. Okay, so that's one potential hiccup. Um, what's maybe another one? Well, here's another one is that uh, the default location to install Velociraptor is user local sbin. And um, user local sbin is not there by default. It is a common place to put, you know, uh, static binaries into the user local, but it's not there by default. So if you do a root installation, which you would to get this here, then root's going to create this directory, but it's going to create it so that only root has access to it. Now, the problem there is if you need to go and coach that user through, hey, I want to give full disk access here uh, to Velociraptor, it's not going to be able to find Velociraptor because the user does not, the regular user doesn't have uh, rights to read it. So um, just a simple little kind of glitch there, but I just want to point it out because you might run into it. And so the fix, what, well, a couple of different possibilities. One is you can just make sure you give read access to that user local SBIN as part of your process. Then at that point, uh, from full disk access, the user can click on and browse to SBIN and find Velociraptor and add it. And, and then we'll be able to you know, check the box. And from here, you've got Velociraptor having full disk access, at least in the, in the TCC sense of the term, to be able to get to documents, downloads, desktop, et cetera. Okay, so uh, one other possibility here is you could just change the installation path to a different location somewhere that the um, you know the user already has access. This is just the default, but that can be configured in the uh, config file. Now, an important thing to think about is if you're not sure if it was set up rightly, maybe you've kind of written down some instructions, provided to others, and you just want to see did they do it correctly or not. How could you tell? Well, definitely one way to be able to tell is to go to a user's you know, documents or desktop, try to, uh, with, with a virtual file system, try to you know, enumerate those files. And if it just spins and does nothing, well, that's a pretty good indication it's not working, uh, that it probably doesn't have full disk access. Uh, maybe the better approach too is to just run uh, TCC, the, uh, you know, the, the Transparency Consent and Control. This is an artifact, I think, um, that Wes put together and it allows for um, querying this database. It's a SQLite database. 
if you have been given TCC access, you can query it. Um, it's not protected by SIP, fortunately. So as long as you've been given access to full disk access and um, are running as root, you can query this and you should see results. If you're not seeing results, then definitely we don't have the visibility we need. So you got to kind of go through, make sure that that's set up for full disk access. Here's an example of what it should look like when it is configured properly. And in this case, we're seeing, uh, first off, you're just being able to parse, you know, all of that data in that SQLite database. And specifically, we're seeing that, yes, Velociraptor is included. Uh, the policy is for uh, all, you know, all files here. That's important. So, um, so we're good to go at this point. All right, I'm not going to go deep at all into the MDM option. That's you know really you know going to vary from organization to organization what they're using, but the key point is that Apple does provide the ability to kind of adjust all of those privacy locations. This is some of them here through a privacy preferences control policy or privacy. That's hard to say. Privacy preferences policy control, and uh, so any MDM has the ability to kind of modify that and specify, you know, exactly what applications have the ability to do things like uh, access all files, right? All user files in particular. And so that's really a setting you'd want to do. There's other guide, there's a number of guides out there. Uh, what I link to here is the Apple documentation specifically, but uh, that's just something, you know, you'll work with your organization. I know in my organization, we have a number of different things that are kind of configured by default. So if you have you know, much of a Mac fleet at all, I'm sure you've already, you know, got a team that's pushing policies out like this and it wouldn't be a problem to get it set up. Okay, so um, so that's some background and a lot of background about the hurdles of just getting to the analysis phase. And that's a lot of what I wanted to cover. Now I'm gonna hit a few things here probably pretty quickly uh, just based on time. But um, but that's, you know, that's a big part of doing the Macs. They do lock it down pretty well. And I'd say that's a good thing, uh, but it's also a frustrating thing from a, uh, you know, from a security uh, analytics or an analyst view, right? So if we have to deploy a tool in, in quick form, then that's, that can be a bit of a challenge. But those are where some ideas about how to potentially handle that. Okay, so let's look at a few areas of the Mac that can be, you know, give you some quick wins and just see, you know, some of the capability that's built into Velociraptor specifically, and then the last one is one that's kind of like a, something for, you know, the community we can all work on, maybe figure out a good way to get logging. I'll just uh, give you a heads up that that's logging. Uh, but first and foremost, one of the main things you're gonna encounter a lot when you're doing Mac forensics is um, property lists, plist files, okay? So the plist files are little bitty Windows registries in the sense that they're little configurations uh, files. You can also think of them like back in the day with Windows, it was .ini files, uh, but they're generally used on a per application basis or um, on user basis to track things like, you know, most frequently used applications or, or files, all kinds of things. Like pretty much if you're a Windows person, you think about what the registry can store. This is kind of like the registry broken apart into tons of little files that are stored uh, in various locations across the file system. So it's important we can parse these out. There are two formats. There's the older XML version, and then there's the newer binary version. And we can handle both of those within Velociraptor. So the, the uh, Mac OS system plist artifact, you just point it at the plist and can go and kind of pull out that particular data here in sort of a, a JSON structure. In this case, we're uh, using, looking at the system version information and seeing kind of what the build is for this version of Mac OS 12.4 here. On the right, you're just seeing what so those format of those files look like if you were to kind of look at them, you know, in a text view or in the case of XML, you can even see, I think just barely got it in here, but it actually says it's a property list uh, in there. And then uh, the, the binary property list start with BP list as the, uh, as the kind of the magic, uh, magic signature or, uh, you know, file signature there. Okay, what about the Apple file system? So uh, Apple migrated to their, their current file systems, big update from HFS Plus they had for like 20 years. 
Uh, they updated her in the 2016, 2017 timeframe. I think that the fully went into production in 2017 and it started with iOS first and then it went to uh, Mac OS later in the year. It has a lot of functionality like for direct uh, support of both encryption and uh, solid state drives. So you can, you know, knowing what some of their focus has been, that makes total sense. Uh, it has 64 bit, you know, timestamps, nanosecond resolution, all four timestamps, MACB. There is no journal that's uh, tied to it. So that's a little bit of a bummer because we do often look at journaling as a way to kind of get a hint about what's happened on the file system. But we'll get to another artifact in a bit called uh, file system events that gives us that same visibility. So it's really not a big deal for us from a forensic standpoint for the most part. It has native support for snapshots and that can come into play both with Time Machine, which is not on by default, but a lot of, a lot of you know, users and organizations turn it on. In that case, you'll get a, a kind of a short term local set of snap, snapshots for Time Machine. And then file cloning feature, which is a pretty smart feature, which um, allows the operating system to, instead of actually copying data for copied files, just basically create a new inode for the file, for the copied file and point to the original data on the disk so that it's not having to, you know, literally copy and use the space and take up the time. Uh, they use differentials and snapshots to handle that in case, you know, one of those files changes, it can just update the, the, the blocks that have updated. So there's snapshot build functionality built in. Now I'll point out here a really useful, I'm a huge fan of file system timelines. I think you can learn a lot about what's happening on a system in a time frame of interest, uh, just based off of pure file system timestamps. So we can do that with Velociraptor. Uh, generic forensic timeline is kind of multi-OS support. I did make a custom one though, because uh, what I noticed is it didn't have the B time. I wanted to grab the B time and put that in there. So it's just a simple update to, to add that column. Uh, maybe we'll, you know, end up updating that uh, forensic timeline artifact just to get that by default. But uh, that's definitely handy. Okay, another artifact that's built in there is to query users on the system, and uh, there's a couple of different ways to do that. Actually, one is for this location in private var db ds local nodes default users, and it ends up having a whole lot of plists in that location because there are a whole lot of built-in uh, built user accounts. And each user account is going to have a plist. It's going to have a little bit of configuration about that user. And most of these you'll see start with an underscore. And those are kind of back up, or not back up, but uh, system, built-in system accounts or added system accounts for various services. The ones that are shown here that are more or less your standard user accounts, there's root and user in this particular case. Down here at the bottom that was parsed was root and sans deeper. And so you get a little bit of information here again. Notice it's got the uh, user shell. That's kind of cool. So for sans deeper, it's been as ZSH. And uh, another thing that's not shown here, but it's kind of interesting, is you actually have the password hint that can be parsed out of this as well. Now, one thing to bear, bear in mind, if your organization is using some type of directory service for logging into your Mac systems, then, uh, then these are not going to show those accounts. These are for local accounts. So to kind of validate, cross-reference, uh, check what other accounts might be there, you just do a directory listing against slash users, see if there's any difference, differences, and that would totally make sense if you're using something like AD to authenticate uh, the users. All right, persistence, hugely important. Kind of about every case that we're going to work with, it's you know any uh, you know advanced persistent threat, right, is going to have some persistence mechanism. Just like other operating systems, there's a ton of locations where this can take place. Uh, I'll just go ahead and skip and show you this. The the link there, I'm going to show it to you because it's pretty cool. Um, just like the good old REM keys, if you're familiar with that in the Windows world, uh, gentleman here's done a similar blog series called uh, Beyond the Good Old Launch Agents. So beyond the good old launch agents, this is the first 10. And then we go back here, there's they're up to about 30, just about. So lots of different places, lots of different locations that we could end up um, you know, having attackers kind of put backdoor startup locations. The launch agents themselves, that's how this uh, article or the series was named. That's your most like, likely scenario, right? That's like equivalent to maybe a REN key or probably in, in practice, it's more like your services uh, for Windows. 
It's going to be things that can automatically start. Honestly, it's kind of even more like um, maybe scheduled tasks because there's a lot of flexibility in how these launch agents can be created. Um, but there are really scheduled tasks in the case of like cron jobs. Uh, on the previous page, there was periodic, which is kind of related to this. This is launch items, which is almost like a run key. That's something that's easy also for users to set up themselves. Uh, shell, anytime we're talking about Linux uh, in particular or Unix based backends, of course, uh, FreeBSD is the backend to Mac. We got to think about shell startup scripts, and there's lots of startup scripts where the attacker could either create new ones or just modify existing ones. Okay, so so keep that in mind. Launch uh, launch D is definitely going to be the most, most common one, but any of these could potentially come into play, and we want to be on the lookout for them. Now, fortunately, uh, with Velociraptor, we've got some good visibility of this. There's a uh, macOS detection auto runs. It has about eight of the most common, if I recall off the top of my head auto start locations, including definitely the launch agents, launch daemons, pretty sure cron, uh, those login items, and there's you know another four or five. One of the things uh, we wanted to be doing here is just obviously look for unusual names. So if you can all if, if you can have a way to kind of use a um, you know a, a gold build, a system that you, you suspect is nice and clean, you can always do some differential analysis. Now that uh, might not be quite as easy within Velociraptor directly, or maybe you've got a cool trick to do that, but you can always pull this information out, uh, get into CSV, do some different things to kind of dip it, look for outliers, right? Uh, kind of stacking in that sense. Another really um, you know, powerful technique is going back to timeline analysis and just look and see what has changed. Most of these are gonna be configured either by creating new files, like new plists that would go in, for example, the uh, in, in the launch daemons, as we're seeing here, these are plist files. Uh, in fact, this one's for VMware at launch, uh, VMware at launch D tools plist. That's also how Velociraptor maintains its persistence as well. But looking for new ones, looking for ones that have been modified recently. So uh, here's just an example of you know taking the notebook and going in and doing an order by M time and just filter you know sort by most recently modified and see what's at the top. So that can be uh, be pretty helpful there. Of course, uh, you know if there's anything unusual sticking out, we will start to validate contents. That goes back again towards if you've got a, a good clean reference image that you can look at, kind of look what the differences are. All right, two last topics. So I'm gonna go a couple minutes over, but I'm almost uh, almost at the end. This one's really cool. I uh, talked to Mike a, a month or so ago about this, and he took a look at the papers like, yeah, we need this. And by the next morning, like I think I talked to him my evening, by the next morning he had it. So <laughs> would have taken me a month to do it. But he created a, a, a partial for this. I'll show you in a moment. But what the heck is FS events? Uh, again, I kind of I, I quib, uh, kind of put you at Windows in there a lot as far as tr trying to draw parallels because I'm just so familiar with it. But if you know Windows, it's like the US in journal. And it's really there for the same purpose, which is to provide hints to the operating system and not even to the operating system, actually more for applications that are using the operating system that are wanting to track certain changes to files. A great example in, in both Windows and uh, Mac is the ability to index files. In the Mac world, that's Spotlight. And so Mac wants to be able to look for files that have changed so that it can index the text and make it easy for users to be able to search for that file based off the text in the file. And um, and so you know the FS events is what turns into that capability that 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 process that and feature that is watching for changes to files, and provides an ability for other applications to subscribe to that kind of log, that API, and get a list of files that have changed say within the say last hour or last day or something like that. So FS uh, events does work in the background. It is uh, run by FS Daemon, FS Events Daemon, FSD. The, uh, the data is stored in a bunch of little gzipped log files. Each one can contain up to 5,000 events uh, in the root of the file system in .fs events D, the hidden directory there. This can go for several days or several months, potentially. Uh, just depends how busy that system is. I have some systems that are not that busy, and it goes back months for sure, not even years, honestly. So this can go back pretty far in certain cases. The downside is it's not always enabled. It definitely, um, I've got some system where it's just not enabled. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, this is a great uh, research article from Nicole Ibrahim. She does talk about ways to 
force force it to be disabled. In fact, attackers can do that as well. Um, but on my systems, I didn't force them to be disabled. And so I have, you know, uh, one or two systems where it's just not enabled. So you'll have to, and the way I can tell is uh, this directory just doesn't exist. Okay, uh, quick look at a use case. This is, uh, again, very similar to US in journal. We can look for interesting activity for files and folders. Now, just some ideas out there, how you might use this data. You can monitor and kind of pivot off of folders of interest and see what files have been added, deleted, changed within those directories. So attacker working directory, users downloads and their trash directories, what files have kind of come in and out of those locations. The beauty about this is it's ongoing logs, so you can see those changes over time. Uh, temp directories, and that's actually what we're seeing here. In this example from our forensic 608 case, uh, there was uh, an attacker had created a dot data hidden directory within private temp and put some, uh, you know, some exfil in here essentially. So you can do that by pivoting, kind of, you know, filtering off of file folders of interest. Of course, files of interest too. If you do know like specific malware or different uh, scripts that are being used, you know, other kind of indicators and, and potentially malicious um, programs, executables, those are all useful things to search for. Uh, archive files, as well as just flat out looking for what's been deleted lately. That might be interesting too. So here's a notebook uh, filter where you can look for the flag FSE uh, underscore delete. The uh, the codes that are, the, the text codes are a little bit different than we're seeing here. This is, in this case, it was just called removed for things that were deleted. This is an example of being parsed uh, from a dead box image using Yogesh Khatri's uh, Mac app tool. Okay, here's that uh, new artifact. It is now in version uh, 6.6. .6. Thank you, Mike, for uh, knocking this out, and it works very nicely. So a big caveat, though, to be aware of, and this isn't uh, related specifically to Velociraptor by any means, it's just how FS events work, is even though we do provide a hint of when things change, you don't actually have a timestamp when these individual files were updated. That is not included in the log. But we can kind of get a hint, we can kind of ballpark it by looking at, well, when is the last time that the file, the log file that tracks this file of interest, when was that last modified? And so that's what this M time is tracking here. The last time that the log file, uh, which contains the event saying this particular file changed or this particular file uh, or directory, I guess I should say, uh, this ownership changed or this particular uh, file was renamed, that information is tracked in this particular log file, and that log file was last changed at this date and timestamp. So ultimately, you'll end up seeing a whole bunch of events that come from a single um, file that have the same last modification time, like these last two is a good example of that. Uh, you don't know exactly when this event happens, but it's a pretty good time frame generally. So for if I go back one, I'll just say um, these timestamps absolutely were when our attacker was busy on the system. Uh, Turned out the attacker was quite busy on, on Valentine's Day in 2020. Okay, I know I'm totally going over, so apologies for that. Just the last point here, Apple logging, and this is really just to put a pin in it in a certain sense. Uh, Apple logging has changed their logging format a couple of different times. Originally, it was more just standard uh, syslog clear text. Then they moved for a short while to uh, Apple uh, system logs, which is a, a binary format, a little more efficient, I suppose. But then they relatively quickly have transitioned to Apple Unified Log. And it is truly meant to be unified, covering really all of their platforms. Um, and man, when I say logging, I'm talking about some logging here. This thing can go big. Um, in our example 608 Mac image, which was only a 40 gigabyte image, the whole thing, it produced 38 million events and 12 gigs when you parse it out in CSV. Now, how does that happen on a you know, on a on a third on a 40 gig image, it's because the binary format is very uh, succinct and very efficient. But there's tons of flags, and when you pull those flags out to make meaningful logs, like in a CSV, they become quite large. But regardless of you know the size of that CSV, the point is 38 million events. That's a ton. All right. So how can you look at that on a live system, the log file, the command line, or the console app? And then so the last point, and this is really just kind of for future thought here, like what we might be able to do. We don't have a good artifact for it right now. I uh, had some talk, some chats online with uh, with 
Matt Green and, and, and Wes, and we were thinking about some different ideas. Both of them actually pointed me to an excellent new uh, tool that just came out a couple of weeks ago from Mandiant called uh, Mac OS Unified Logs. Uh, Yogesh also has a, a, a parser in his Mac app tool for this. So you can pull the logs offline and parse them with these tools, okay? So that's one option. And we could do that with Velociraptor. It's a pretty large data set. If you run this log collect command, uh, maybe through, um, you know, kind of directly on the system, uh, spacing out here for a second, but, uh, you know, the, the kind of the live uh, collection uh, through Velociraptor, you could run that, it would generate the, a, a directory, you could kind of zip that up, bring it back and kind of parse it, but it's a pretty large data set. What are some other options? Potentially just doing some queries on the live system. So here's a couple of examples of using that log command to do filters, for example, keyword searches in this predicate syntax saying event message, for example, contains Velociraptor. Or this is one that Matt suggested, you know, we can get a little bit more detailed even by having an or statement in here and kind of do maybe some ors and ands. Um, this is an example from a link, a reference link I had back on slide 14 for TCC, where you're troubleshooting TCC specifically and looking maybe for some keywords and even begins with. So what other possibilities? Stretch goal here, maybe we could somehow stream this back. So Jamf, very popular MDM uh, tool, has this capability. They somehow are, they're using the logging API, uh, from what I can tell, to stream that data back. And they've got this article here on how to kind of use this predicate syntax to pull logs of interest back through Jamf and then onto your, um, uh, your uh, SIM, for instance. All right. So I went over, sorry about that, but uh, I had a lot I wanted to cover and uh, hopefully it was useful to you. You know, you know some of it's basic if you've been doing this with Max, but a lot of us, you know, are just kind of getting our feet wet, honestly, with Max. And so um, I think there's a lot of room for us to keep exploring, keep doing different things. I'm definitely interested in keeping the conversation going and um, kind of contributing some, some ideas and maybe even some artifacts if I can get my VQL together. Uh, so anyway, thanks to everybody. This is such an amazing tool. I just love Velociraptor and uh, always happy to kind of try to contribute in, in my little way. Uh, again, there's my uh, link to the article. It's got some good, or to the presentation. It's got some links that you might want to take advantage of. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thanks a lot, Mike. Does anybody have any questions for Mike, either in the Q&A or in the Discord channel? Uh, pop them in there. Uh, I want to thank Mike for a great presentation. As a Mac user myself, I found this presentation to be very uh, pertinent and, and engaging. So thank you very much for that. All right, thank you. All right.